Joining us tonight in the GB News pub for Talking Pints is Terry Stone. Terry, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Welcome. Very nice to see you. Now, you were, 30 years ago, organising uh, as a big wheel in what we can call the nighttime entertainment industry, or maybe the alternative nighttime <laughs> entertainment <laughs> industry. You were organising raves, and they went on to become big. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I can remember Rave Nation, and I have to tell you, I was never particularly tempted right. uh, to go to them, but this became a massive thing, didn't it? I'm, I'm sure I've seen you at night. <laughs> I'm sure I've seen you. I'm sure I've seen you. <laughs> yeah, I was looking a bit uh, younger then, but, I mean, this became a massive thing. Where did the rave come from? Where did, where did the concept come from? Um, well, I, th I think, yeah, when you sort of rewind to sort of 1988, when the, when the scene started off, um, I was a sales rep at the time. I'd been upgraded from my job at McDonald's. And right. um, <laughs> I was living the dream. Um, obviously, the recession came, lost my job. Um, and then everyone kept saying to me, you've got to come to these raves, you've got to come to these dance parties. And at the time, you know, I was boxing, I was running. <clears throat> yeah, the last thing I wanted to do was to be dancing in the field taking drugs. So um, I was completely anti it. But... Which, which, by the way, is my impression of rave. Right, OK. Well, right. well this, this wasn't technically... That was sort of before. Um, but I, the first rave I went to was probably um, in 1990 at a place called Stearns. And this is when it was, <clears throat> you know, legitimised and you had to have a licensed premises. So there was not really any dancing in fields. And um, I went to this rave. Now, <clears throat> my, my sort of experience of clubbing was sticky carpets, pints, kebabs and what they used to call the erection section, <laughs> you used to, you know... We're before the watershed, so be careful. OK, but you know, you know what I mean, the slow dances, the Luther yeah. Vandross music, and, um, you know, we... Um, that was my, my sort of, you know, thing about, you know, clubbing. And then when I went to this rave, there was probably 2,000 people in this room, there was lots of, you know, hot women, there was hardly any guys, and, but the guys that were there all wanted to be your friend, all the girls wanted to be your friend... And it was just like walking into this alternative reality where you just went, sign me up. So um, I sort of walked out of this rave and I just thought, I haven't got any money. I'm on the dole, obviously, so I lost my job because of the recession. <clears throat> and I thought, how can I go to these raves? And there was these people outside giving out flyers. So I said, oh, do you get paid for this? And they was like, yeah, you know, we get £10 a man. And I used to go out with sort of 15, 20 people. So quick thinking, I just thought, well... Have you got a number? So I rang the guy and said, look, if I bring my friends to give these flies out, can you get us in VIP and can we get paid? And he was like, sure. So I rang all my friends up and said, right, you've all got a new job. I'll get you in for free on me, but you'll give out the flyers. So I went from earning, I think I was on £20 a week on the dole mm -hmm. to getting £150 to £200 a night three or four times a week. So I come off the dole, um, sat my own flyer in business, was a ticket tout, and I, I was making, you know, thousands a month doing... just giving out bits of paper and selling tickets for raves. And then I then got a magazine called The Scene Magazine, which was this... It was like a sort of Viz, private eye-type yep. magazine, but for the rave scene. <clears throat> Started off as a black-and-white magazine, and then it went full full colour, 128 pages in Smiths. Fast-forward to sort of middle of 93, and then people were saying, well, you've got the flies, you've got the tickets, you've got the magazine why don't you put a rave on? So I was like, that's a good idea. So then I started One Nation, yep. um, which became one of the biggest drum and bass um, events in the world. And, it, 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 you know, people like DJ Fresh, Sigma, Andy C, all these huge, you know, people now that are sending out Wembley on their own, these big festivals, all started off for me. Um, and then three years after that, um, a friend of mine said, oh, the garage scene's taken off, let's do Garage Nation. So I did Garage Nation. Then I started winning awards. Um, but I'd say the late 90s, it changed and, and it became dangerous. And people, you know, started shooting each other and there was, like, knife... All the knife crime and gun crime you're hearing about now was still there back then. But, obviously, it was swept under the carpet. And, and you were making... But then you made a lot of money out of this. Well, I'd, I'd, I really could live in Nigeria. Yeah. <laughs> I could afford a few Bacardis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could. So why does something like that suddenly get so nasty? Well, I think, um, I think what happens when something's popular, I think, you know, you, you've seen it with a grime scene, you see it with this drill music scene, you know, I think as the which music... Is, which is horrendous. Yeah, but I think... I, I think mean, the lyrics in this drill music are horrendous, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the, in, 
<clears throat> I think what happened with the garage scene was um, the crews sort of were formed and the garage music was nice, sexy music, everyone would dress up in suits, everyone would be drinking champagne. It was, it was you know, they used to call it like a, a sort of... They, they referred to it as a stoosh way of going out where you dressed up and you mm. made an effort <clears throat> and all the girls, you know, looked fantastic. And then I think when the crews come in, it become about five or six people sort of rapping and the music sped up and then the music changed. And I think when the music changed, then the fashion changed. And then instead of people wearing a suit, they wear a hoodie, they wear tracksuits, they wear sunglasses, they wear trainers. So obviously you're more likely to get into a fight or cause problems when you're in a tracksuit than you are yeah. if you've got a £2,000 suit on from Savile Row. So I think that was w w two of the factors. And then I think what happened was <clears throat> a lot of the clubs... Um, started to get redeveloped. So there was a lack of clubs. And I just think the respect, you know, in when I first started doing events, there was respect. You know, people would go out, someone trod on your foot, they'd say they were sorry, they want to be really? your friend. It was very polite. Polite rave. Very polite. And, and everyone wanted to be your friend, right? But I think the issue with, with, with it become a bit sort of like, you know, I'm really cool and you trod on my shows. Is, and is that kind of what was happening in society perhaps as well? I think so. I think the, I think the big issue... You know, um, I think if you look at um, a lot of... And, and a lot of the people that went to these raves, there was a lot of, you know, people from all walks of life, but obviously the majority of them, I'd say, were probably from the working class. Mm. And I think, obviously, <clears throat> if, you're, if, you're, if you're from the working class and, you, and you're on a council estate and you're in a, you know, single-parent family or, you know, you're, 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 you're on an estate and you sort of see these crimes being committed and you haven't got any money, mm. you kind of fall into that lifestyle. And I think a lot of that was happening. And I don't know where yeah. this gangster stuff come from, but it seemed as if they were looking at America and they were thinking, oh, this is really cool if I carry a gun and if I shoot someone. And, and you know, these kids are sort of doing these things. I mean, w w there was w one of my doormen who um, was an eighth down in martial arts and he was probably the only person you wouldn't want to have a fight with. Um, and, and he was the guy that would be on the door and he'd literally be like, you've got to stand there. And he's very polite. Um, and these two guys come up to the door. This was when I'd sold my business. It was at the Coliseum in Vauxhall. And they said, we're not queuing up. The VIPs are walking in. He said, well, if you don't queue up, you're not coming in. And they just went, bang. And they shot him seven times. Really? Outside a club for nothing. So when that sort of thing happens, you think... That there's, and these kids got caught. They're probably doing 20 years in jail. And they think they're cool. And that, 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 that message has got to stop. And I don't know how you stop it, but... No, it's desperate stuff. So you reinvent yourself, Terry. You decide to become an actor. That's correct. But it was all, <laughs> it was all an act of fate. My whole life has been... But one, one, one set of uh, things after another. But how do you go from being on the dole? I get the rave thing. You right. saw an opportunity. You can yeah. make cash quickly. Yeah. You built it and developed it. I get that. You used yeah. your nouse, basically, yeah. Yeah. and did it effectively and well. But to suddenly go into acting and film... I mean, what do you know about film producing? How on um, earth do you get involved in at that? At the time, I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but now I know quite a lot. <laughs> You're clearly one of the great <laughs> blaggers, aren't you? <laughs> um, I think what it is... Um, bear in mind, when I was doing these events... On a busy month, I'd be doing 20 events from 3,000 to 20,000. So I was doing these big events, um, very organised, very disciplined, very hard working. You know, I'm 24 7. So if someone says to me at one in the morning, we've yeah. got to do this, I'm doing it. I'm not crying yeah. saying, oh no, it's one o'clock in the morning. Work from home. No, I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that is what, what everything is wrong <laughs> with this country at the moment, because everyone's worked from home and they don't realise they've oh, actually got so back to old work. fashioned. So you're so out of date, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but, but what happened was I sold my business <clears throat> and my wife, um, uh, she, she, she was eight months pregnant. <clears throat> and I remember this random phone call, someone said to me, I'm making a movie, do you want to be in it? So I went, yeah, why not? Be a laugh. So I went and done this little part in this film and I worked with, uh, there was a few actors, Martin Hancock from Coronation Street, Billy Murray was in EastEnders, um, Scott Welsh was in Snatch, there was a few of these characters and they was all saying, oh, you know, You've got a sort of natural thing for this. You should do it. And I was like, well, how do I become an actor? And they said, well, you've done your first job. <laughs> so you're, you've done better than most actors. So I said, OK, well, I'll get the video clip and I'll get some pictures done and I'll write a letter to some people saying, I'm an actor, I need representation, right? I sent out to 300 agents. I got three responses and then I got signed to one of them. So I walks in to see my wife and she's laying there on the bed. She's eight months pregnant. She's got the Maltesers on her stomach. And I said, babe, I said, I've got some good news. And she said, what's that? I said, I've worked out what I'm going to do. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to become an actor. And she spat her Maltesers out. 
And she said, um, she said, are you taking drugs? <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, go over into the bathroom, look in the mirror. You're not Brad Pitt. <laughs> she said, have a, have a reality check. And I looked at her and I said, look, babe, I said, I really appreciate your honesty and, and supporting me, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that, I did what jobbing actors do, EastEnders, The Bill, yeah. um, some theatre stuff. Um, and then after a year of it, <laughs> I think I'd earned eight grand, so I realised I'd made a massive mistake. And I think if some So of there were bit part roles you were getting. Yeah. yeah. And I think when, when you look into it, 95% of all actors are unemployed. So <clears throat> I think when you know that, you start thinking to yourself, I've made a massive mistake. I was earning good money, doing all this mm. stuff. And I've now jumped from that, and I'm at the bottom yeah. of the, the ladder again. Yeah. Um, and then I was with a friend, and he just said to me, um, how's the acting going? And I said, honestly, he said, honestly. I said, not very well. I said, I think my wife was right. <laughs> <laughs> like she always is. Um, but um, she... Um, a good admission. But, 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 she, but, she, but, but he said, you know, what, what do you want to do? I said, really, I want to be in the movies. And he said, well, what, why don't you make one? I said, you've been organising these dance parties. It can't be mm. that difficult. So I think my feet, I said, well, look, if I put 10 grand in, will you put 10 grand in? And he said, absolutely. So what we did was we went out to all our mates and said, look, we're going to make a film, it'd be a laugh, let's all put some money in. So we, f we crowdfunded for my friends, their first movie, um, and it was called One Man and His Dog, and it was a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like going to film <coughs> school and how not to make a movie. So you learned from it? Exactly. All, all my bad experience in life have been learning curves, so yeah. I don't take anything negative out of it. I just think, well, that was how not to do it. Yeah. But then the next film we did, <clears throat> we made, um, which was one of the first urban British gangster films called Rolling with the Nines, mm. which was all about the, um, you know, at the time in, in... We made this in 2005, and at the time that's when the black-on-black -black gun crime had exploded and, you know, it was all over the papers, and uh, it, this is obviously... You know, the jewel scene had just started off. And um, it got BAFTA nominated, that film. Uh, one, one rain dance. Um, and then that led to Rise of the Foot Soldier, which was yeah. the big film that a lot of people know me as. I normally wear a silly blonde wig. Um, there's a great meme of me, Trump, and Boris Johnson saying, spot the difference. So, <laughs> you've seen it. So, um, so I, th I don't know if they've, they've copied the hair or, or whether their hair was already like that. But... <laughs> But you've had some success with this. You made some money again out of this. Yeah, I mean, today, I've, I've, as an actor, I've been in 33 uh, films, TV shows, and as a producer, I've made 28. So I've done a lot. I've worked with all the studios, worked with Netflix, you know, so I've, I've done, you know, amazingly well in a short space of time. But I haven't really got started yet, Nigel. I'm sort of... Oh, really? Oh, this is it? You've, just, you've, you've, you've barely begun? I'm, I'm, I'm only 18 years in, yeah. So, I've, I've, you know, I didn't expect it to take this long, but um, the new film that's in the cinemas now... Um, that's been really good for me because that was the first film um, I played the lead role in, and I worked with Vinnie Jones and Keith Allen. So there's some great actors in there. Yeah. Um, and um, the film recently won Best Feature at the Marbella Film Festival. I won Best Actor, and here at the UK, it was number ten in the box office. And if you look at the box office, it's all <coughs> fifty, hundred, two hundred million pound films. So, Terry, you know. Thank you for joining us here. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me on, Nigel. And uh, nice I've got to tell you, what a great story. It just goes to show, if you've got self-confidence, you can do almost anything in life. And that really is Terry Stone's story. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.